All right, Psalms 19. I'll try to get a little further than I did in Sunday school this morning. Thank you for coming back tonight. I appreciate the encouragement uh, uh, for me. Uh, I, uh, um, I just, I can't thank you enough. You know, you're living the... You're living in the latter days. He said, well, they've been saying that forever. Yeah, but your latter days are at least more latter than they were when they were saying it. And uh, I you know, wish I could tell you 100% positive that it is the final days or the last days. I hope that it is. Uh, but uh, it's an anomaly nonetheless. Thank you, Deke. It's an, it's an anomaly nonetheless uh, that you're still coming to church on a Sunday morning, let alone on a Sunday night. Oh, I got to put on a microphone. Uh, somebody stole. Oh, no, here it is. I was at a church not long ago in uh, North Carolina, and the preacher came up. He goes, Preacher, do you, uh, do you think it would be okay? I, I'm really sorry. Our microphone uh, busted night before last. And uh, do you think you'd be able to preach uh, loud enough for, without a microphone? <laughs> I said, um, never have had that complaint where somebody didn't think, I, I said, I'll, I'll try, I'll do my best, you know, to, to do that. So we did a whole service there, and there's no tape of it. You say, what did you say? I can't tell you, there's no tape of it. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, is that, we good now? We're ro rocking, moving, whatever you call it. Anyway, here's what I was saying to you. Uh, it's an anomaly. You know how hard it is for you to fight to overcome just to get to church on a Sunday morning, right? It becomes exponentially more difficult on Sunday night. You say, why? Well, if you go and have a decent dinner, uh, today we had some dinner with some folks. I was highly, heavily instructed, I, I know you're standing, give me just a second, by a little fella. He's, uh, he's uh, still in kindergarten. And he said, uh, if you want to be skinny like me, <laughs> he said, you first of all need to stop eating. I'm like, lunch hasn't even come. He said, you can have half. <laughs> and then tonight, ride your bicycle for two miles, run for 20 minutes, breakfast in the morning, half a portion at lunch, and no dinner. I'm telling you, his mom and dad were sitting there, and we had witnesses across there. And I said, uh, oh, okay, that's it. So when they brought my lunch that was there that came with these little wrap things and all that kind of stuff. And he said, you can have about that much of that right there. I said, well, don't you think I'm doing pretty? He goes, uh, no. <laughs> I'm like, well, okay then. So, but do you realize after you've had a meal and then it's afternoon and you're getting prepared for whatever's tomorrow, work and school and all that other and, and maybe doesn't kind of that bed call you, even though, you know, it's a great ways off, but it's saying, come home, <laughs> come home. <laughs> Aren't you weary? <laughs> come home, <laughs> right? <laughs> and if you do make the mistake of going home, oh, it takes a crane to get you out. It's like you sleep like, it's the best sleep you ever had Sunday afternoon, right? It's like you feel like you're drugged. And then it's like, oh, I don't really, uh, honey, you know, maybe, uh, could you go kick the ox in the ditch and we can. <laughs> so I appreciate you coming back. I don't take it for granted. I really do appreciate you being here. We're going to talk a little bit tonight, get a little bit away from the devil here for a while. And talk about a couple of things when it comes to the flesh and the spirit and being able to understand overcoming the flesh. Now you realize that the new man is not strong enough in and of itself to overcome sin. You have to give it some help. If you don't give it some help, it can't overcome it. Just because you're saved and put on the new man, if you don't support the new man, the new man will succumb to the old man. Can I say this? This is rhetorical. It means I already know the answer to this. You know what I'm telling you is true because every one of us, no matter how long we've been saved, every now and then the old man whips us, doesn't he? So the support comes. Instead of worrying so much about putting down the old man, worry about supporting the new man. So let's, that's, a, that's positive, right? Yeah. So instead of worrying about, let's just take everything away from you, let's just work on supporting the new man. Let's make him stronger. Feed that white dog. All right, verse number 8, Psalms, uh, Psalms 19, verse number 8. Statues of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. 
The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. Talking about the, the judgments and the statutes that are there. Yea, than fine gold, sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. So, so I like having a warning, right? Uh, you ever get pulled over by the police and he gives you a warning instead of giving you the one that cost you in your pocket? Yeah. You, do you ever say thank you for the warning? Yeah. yeah, I appreciate the warning. It doesn't make points go up on your license and it doesn't make you wind up having to come off the hip and pay, right? All right, so he says what, we should be thankful for the warning. And in keeping them is great reward. How about that? What? Who can understand? Watch it. I'm going to give you three things here. His eras. Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Brother Sam, you pray. Would you please ask the Lord to help us out? Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. I, I want to just say this to you as quickly as I can. I don't want to just spend the whole time on these three things. But I want to draw to your attention just three things that I think are imperative or very important for you to know and understand. First of all, he talks about eras. Now, if you already know what the Bible says, your chances for committing an era have been greatly reduced. Right? So, so if you already know what would be pleasing to the Lord, you can't walk along and say, well, I fell into sin. No, you probably knew before you did it that it was already wrong, and you might have even been able to recite chapter and verse. We really can't hide behind the fact that the Lord hadn't told us. But you also want to be careful to not get caught in this mindset or this idea that, you know what, I'm praying and Lord forgive me of all the things that I know were sin, that I did, that I committed, that I did. Well, wait a minute. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. And unless the Holy Spirit is grieved or quenched in you right now, when you mess up, you know you mess up. Amen. But you do have to consider that when David talks about eras, that's things that he does that he's not aware that are grieving to God. Now here's where it can work out. You may learn after a period of time that not just smoking and drinking and cussing are the things that are on the outside, but things as you begin to mature that are matters of the heart, you may eventually learn that you didn't know those things were as much sin as outward sin, and you may not realize they grieve God as much as the things on the outside, and so you might do those things being under aware, you know, this is probably not a good thing. But then the Lord brings them to your attention. Now it's no longer an error. Now it has to do with what's called a secret fault. In order for you to uh, consider what a secret fault is, a fault line would be like uh, how they talk about fault lines in California or different places like that or San Andreas Fault or the big one that runs in the Mississippi that made the Mississippi run backwards. I can't think of the name of it right now. It won't come to my mind. But in the 1800s, that thing split and the Mississippi turned around and instead of running south, it turned around and went north. What's the name of that fault there? Do you remember some of you guys? You don't remember? Where's your... Where's your do you, that's it, Madras, the new, the new Madras fault. That's the, that's the big one. That's the one going to crack the United States in half and, you know, and all this other kind of stuff's going to happen. I don't know if it's ever going to happen or not, but it's a big fault line. What is a fault line? In and of itself, it's just a fault line. But in a secret fault, it is that when I begin to look introspectively, I see the potential for that fault line to become a great earthquake. In other words, when I look at that thing and the Lord brings that secret out, like he says in Ecclesiastes 12, he brings our secrets before him. He knows the thoughts of every man and the secrets that are there, the secret sins that are there. He's talking about now something that has yet to become a sin, but it has the potential to. So what you do is, is when you're looking at it, it's like, you know what? I don't want to create or cause an earthquake, so the best thing for me to do is fix it. I wrote these things down just so that I would remember these things. Uh, time spent with self-pity, self-exaltation, bitterness over the lack of recognition, mentally lazy, judging unmercifully, doing your best to attract attention. That's just a few things that I wrote down. You say, what is that? In and of themselves, they're not outright sin, but they have the potential to become outright sins. So if you look in your life, what might be a sin in your life, it might not be a sin in somebody else's life, but if you ever considered this, the Lord may give you liberty to do something, but in so doing, it may cause a younger brother to stumble. Do you ever think about that? Do you ever think, you know what, there's even certain things that we do that are not sinful, but we don't do it in front of kids because it's not for kids to do. Right? 
you don't talk about business things and things like that in front of kids. It's not because talking about business things are wrong. It's just that that's not an appropriate conversation for kids to have, right? So when we're talking about these things that have to do with uh, secret faults, they're different from presumptuous sin. Presumptuous sin is the final and the third category. Those are sins that David says, I know they're wrong to do and I do them anyway. David knew when he committed the sin that he did, say for instance with Bathsheba or in numbering the tribes of Israel, David knew when he committed those sins that he was doing something that he should not have done. It wasn't an error and it wasn't a secret fault. It was a presumptuous sin. David said, I need to be delivered from that. Presumptuous sin, I wrote it down. It is a premeditated, planned, whether it be adultery, murder, or uh, 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 homosexuality. It's carried out in clear-cut defiance against God. It is a sin against God no matter what your conscience says. Look in 2 Peter chapter number 2. 2 Peter 2. Now, I would dare say this, and this is not to put you under an extreme amount of, of um, uh, conviction. I'll just go ahead and say that. But it is to make you recognize that for the child of God that is born again and saved, sealed to the day of redemption, you have inside you, even without the Bible, you have the Holy Spirit of promise, even if your conscience was seared, and the Holy Spirit will tell you before you do something you shouldn't do. He'll give you a warning. And your clear-cut defiance of that is saying to you, I don't care what God says, I'm going to do it anyway. Now nobody in here can say you haven't done that. The Lord says, you know what, you need to be quiet. You speak up anyway. You ever have an argument with your wife or your husband? And the Lord says, hush. And you're like, I ain't going to hush. I'm going to have the last word. Well, I'm glad. You know, I didn't realize I was with the saints already in glory. <laughs> Y'all have never been that way? Well, well praise the Lord. I, I, I guess I'm the only one guilty of presumptuous sin. Where the Lord said, hey boy, you can shut up. My problem is, is sometimes it's not only do I not shut up, I raise the volume. Now, I know you guys don't do that. I, I understand that. But I, I do. You, know, you say, well, why? Well, the Lord gave me the bellows for a voice. And so I figure, lift up thy voice like a trumpet and cry aloud and spare not. You know. <laughs> oh, that's supposed to be for preaching, right? <laughs> I guess you probably don't do that. But I did notice a few uh, cracks in your windshields out there from the decibels that have been inside your car and some of that, you know, spit on the inside of the car where people come by you, you have a tendency to sort of, you know, I guess you're telling them about the love of Jesus, I don't know, but do but you ever think about it? Presumptuous sin. You knew you were going to do it and you did it anyway. That's a dangerous sin. Suppose the Lord is presumptuous about him punishing you for it. When you presume on God, look if you will please in uh, 2 Peter chapter number 2, and you commit that sin, you know what you're doing in effect? You're saying, I'm trusting God's going to be merciful and long-suffering and forgiving. You're doing what Paul said, you're treading underfoot the grace of God. What you're doing is, is you're saying, well, I'm going to do this, but I'm, I, I'm trusting my eternal security, and I'm praying that the punishment for it won't be too bad. Have you ever experienced God's love and forgiveness of what you've done wrong and the Lord lets you do it? After a while you get to thinking, well, I guess it doesn't matter to him. I mean, it's worth, uh, he's been so merciful to him. Yeah, but when's that cup of mercy run out? When does he finally say, I've had enough? And then put something on you like Ajax won't take off. Second Peter chapter number 2, here's the root of that problem right there. Chiefly, them that walk after the flesh in lust of uncleanness and despise government presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Now what that is, is a premeditated sin. And many people believe the truth, come to, let's see, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2, but they don't do anything with it. Now I mentioned to you this morning, uh, it's great that you read your Bible. But here's the balance for reading your Bible. You say it must be prayer. No, it's the application of it. Reading the Bible doesn't help you unless you apply what you've read. So if you spend as much time applying what you've read, not only does the Bible become more real to you, but it helps you to grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We're good as Bible believers about talking about how many times you read the Bible as if reading the Bible transforms you. Reading the Bible does not transform you. I know they're going to run that one out over the internet and go, Brother Peacock's gone crazy. He said reading the Bible doesn't change you. Reading the Bible doesn't change you. 
believing the Bible changes you. You say, I believe it. Okay, then why are you committing presumptuous sin? Oh, well, no, that's different. No, it's believing it, right? It's applying it. That's what matters. I won't apply it if I don't believe it. Watch. When it comes to salvation, you say people read the Bible. They read about salvation. Yeah, they read it. You go take them. Let's say you take them through the Romans road. Let's say you say take them over as easy as one, two, three. You take them to, back to uh, 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 23 and talk about the blood atonement and all that. You can look that up later. It'll give it to you right there plain and simple about salvation. Uh, you can go through all that stuff. They read it. What do they do with it? Nothing. They didn't get saved. You say, why? They didn't believe it. Right. If they don't believe it, they don't apply it. The difference in you and them is not that you're smarter, it's that you believe what you read and applied it, and therefore you're saved. See, it comes in the application. Reading the Bible doesn't change you. It's believing the Bible and applying the Bible that winds up changing you. That's what changes your life and causes you to be able to grow. First Thessalonians chapter number 2, verse number 13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but it as in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh in you that read it. Is that what he says? Does he say is that that read it? What does he say? That believe it. So if I don't believe it, then guess what happens? I don't apply it. So therefore, it doesn't do me any good. You can know all the Ten Commandments, and guess what? It doesn't do you any good to know them if you don't apply them. Right? You have to have a, a, a um, uh, what do you call the thing? It's a called a, 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 do they even have it in a handbook anymore? It's probably online, I guess, anymore. A driver's handbook. And you have to read that. You know what it says? If you don't pass this test, then you can't get a driver's license, besides the driving portion of the thing. Is that right? Well, if you don't believe it, you know what you do? You say, well, I can drive a car. And you get behind the wheel of the car and you take off driving and you drive the speed limit and you obey all the lines. You obey everything that you know is written in the book, but it, you forgot one part. It said if you pass the test and then pass the, the dri driving part of that, then you can get a driver's license. Well, I, I know how to do it without having to pass the test. Why do I have to pass the test? Because the book said you've got to pass the right. test. Well, I don't believe there's a consequence. No, it says Florida State Statute on there, 322.23, says if you don't do that, then you don't get to have a driver's license. You're driving without a driver's license, and that's a jailable offense, and it's a misdemeanor, and, and you can get this and that and the other for it. I don't believe that. I'll never get caught because you'd say, why? Because I'm such an anomaly. I pay all the speed limit signs, and I do everything I'm supposed to do. And then one day, somebody you know lights up the bubblegum machine behind you and pulls you over and says, driver's license, registration, insurance card, please. <laughs> driver's license? I don't need a driver's license. I can drive better than anybody out here. I've been driving for four years now and I haven't had a single wreck and I haven't been stopped one time. Nobody's even suspected me. Driver's license, registration, insurance card, please. I don't need a driver's license. I drive as well as everybody. <laughs> did you read the handbook? Yeah, I read it. What did it tell you? If you didn't get a, pass the test, you can't get a driver's license. I, but I can drive. I don't care. You did not pass the required test by the certified instructor. You're not entitled to the driver's license. But I can drive. But you didn't pass the test. Do you understand? The book says, guess what happens? So the next thing you know, you're standing outside the car and he's writing you a fistful of tickets like that. And you're like, okay, I can drive home. And he laughs and says, drive home. We're calling a hook, man. You're going to get your car towed and it's going to be over here and you better not be the one that goes and picks it up. You're going to be walking or you can call somebody to come pick you up. And not only that, you're going to appear at room 330 of the courthouse or three, uh, go to 330 East Bay Street, room 100 of the courthouse and set a court date. And you're going to appear in front of the courtroom here and you're going to explain to the judge why you don't have a driver's license and why you don't have a registration and why you don't have insurance. So you go in front of the judge. Judge, I've never had a traffic accident. I've never had a single problem. I've got a stellar driving record. I've got videos of me driving. I've got videos of me driving in the rain and driving in the dark and driving with headlights and without headlights and using my turn signals and using hand signals when I'm not using that. I mean, Your Honor, I mean, I, I'm a perfect driver. And the judge says, uh, did you read the book? I read the book, Your Honor. Did you take the test? I didn't have to take the test. I can drive. You say, you're belaboring the point. No, no, I'm not. Just because you can drive, you're out of order. You're not even entitled to take the driving test until you first pass the written test. 
You don't get to get in the seat with the instructor until they say he passed the written test. Now he can take the driving test. Well, no, I'll go ahead and take the driving test and now I'll get to the written test whenever. You don't get behind the wheel of the car until you've taken the driving test. Is the analogy making any sense to you at all? Oh, preacher, I know what it says, but I don't have to apply it. Well, that's why it doesn't have an effect on you. That's probably why it doesn't mean to you what maybe it means to some of us who realize that the Lord has done things for us that is beyond imagination because we believed what we read, but we didn't just believe it. We made an application in our own personal life so it becomes a living, breathing word to me. Because I found that it worked. Now I know what it's there. I know where the verse is. And I know what it says, but. Right? But what? Take your Bible, if you will, please, and come to Romans chapter number 7. The new nature is not strong enough to conquer that feeling that I don't need to be instructed. It doesn't want to be instructed. It despises government. Now you have to recognize that's true about all of us. Inside every one of us right here, uh, the help of the Holy Spirit is there to try to help you. But you know what He does things decently and in order. And if you want to learn to walk in the Spirit and not walk in the flesh and not have spiritual at atrophy, then you have to have spiritual exercise, spiritual sweat. You've got to make an effort. It's similar to how you work in your body, in your flesh. But you have to recognize in the spiritual battle there has to be not just the seeing of it, the reading of it, and not just the believing in it, but if there's no application to you, it's like going to the gym and sitting there watching these guys working out and you're sitting there and you believe it will change things and you believe proper nutrition will help you and you believe pushing against an object stronger or heavier than you will make you eventually stronger and that you'll be able to do the things that are required. But if you don't get your... Uh, if you don't sit down on that bench and do the exercise, you're not going to improve. You can be a tennis pro in your mind. And you can go out to the tennis court. You know what you can do? You can walk around in your tennis shorts and, and you can bounce a ball off the ground and stuff like that and make people believe you know what you're doing. Right? And you can give instruction... But you never played a game in and of itself and you've never been out there and you don't even know what love this and love that is. You think that has something to do between a man and a woman and that kind of a deal. And then one of the guys want to ask you one day, well, hey, how about throwing a couple of serves up? And you can't even hit it over the net. Because you can think you're a tennis pro, but until you get out on the court and are willing to put in the time, but I've read the manual. Well, did you apply it? You don't go play, what is it, Wimbledon? You have to work your way up through the ranks to be able to go over there and play there. Well, they'd, I'd be at Wimbledon, you know, but, you know, I, I, I tore my meniscus and my Achilles back in the day. I, I can't do quite what I used to could do, but I, what, when you were in the crib? <laughs> <laughs> do you understand? This is, here's a Christian, you ready? A Christian, you know, well, I, I want to be a good Christian, not just a saved person, okay? You believe what the Bible says? Yeah. Have you applied it? Come on. Believe what the Bible says, right? Give attendance to reading. Rightly divide the Bible. How about let's go to James 3. What does it say about the tongue? How about we go to Hebrews 4. What does it say about the heart? What does it say about how you treat other people? What are the Pauline epistles? In 13 epistles and probably the book of Hebrews, how many things is Paul in there saying, exercise, 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 do something, do something, do something, do something. You know why? Because he knows that spiritual laziness is rampant and so he's encouraging you to do something. Why? Because it'll make you the Christian you want to be, but only if you apply it. Amen. You believe a diet will help you lose weight? Come on. I believe it will, preacher. Okay. How come you're not losing weight? Because you don't apply it. It's not that you don't believe that it'll work. I don't care what it is. Mediterranean, paleo, or keto, or, you know, don't eat, or eat air, or whatever it may be, and all that stuff. The principle I'm trying to get across to you is, is that you're constantly complaining about being overweight, but it's not because you don't know that dieting won't help. It's that you won't apply the diet. 
with medical reasons excused. I, I'm just simply saying to you, you're not going to graduate from school unless the teacher says you have to learn this before you go to the next grade. You know what you'd have your kids do? Apply what the teacher says so they can go to the next grade, right? But spiritually, do we not become a little lazy? We become commonplace? Become sort of natural to kind of just hang out in the wherever? We're like the hanging Chad from years ago when, you know, I mean, you can call yourself the hanging David or the hanging Chad or whatever you want to call yourself. But you know what we do? We're just kind of like there, just hanging out, not really applying anything. Give me a couple of verses here. Look in Romans chapter 7. Look, if you will, please, in verse number uh, 23. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity, the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that then with the, 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 excuse me, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh I serve the law of what? I got two natures. I have to apply that principle and understand that this thing right here cannot be defeated without God helping me. You cannot do it on your own. And sheer discipline won't help. You know why? You'll get proud about that. Yes. You'll get proud about your ability to overcome things. That just has to do with discipline. That has nothing to do with anything to do with God. Now you're proud. Now you're like the devil. That's not a good place to be. Psalms chapter number 10. There's a cost involved. And we're all willing to pay a cost, a price. We're willing to do certain things for the things we love, the things we appreciate. Right? Uh, you're willing to work 40 hours or 50 hours or 60 hours a week to have a mortgage, aren't you? Aren't you? This reasonable, right? You're willing to work hard and you get ready to sign on the dotted line and you take out, and they tell me now, I, I haven't bought one in a while, I mean, but, we, but, but over a period of time, I think they have now uh, seven-year car loans, if cars even last seven years anymore. So now I can go buy an $80,000 car that I can't afford, but if you divide it up and give me 100 years to pay for it, oh, hey, the payments are where I can afford it. But that don't mean you can afford it. If that bank calls the loan, you're shot. You just assume they won't call the loan. But if they say car keys or give me the loan payment, ah, I'm up to date. That don't matter. We own the car. We're taking it. Do you understand the principle? And so it, we're like, you know, that's okay to work. I, I mean, you know, so what? I, I, I can make the payment. That doesn't mean anything. You do know and recognize, I've had a conversation with a couple of fellows in the last couple of days about this very thing, and a young lady this afternoon about that, $100 five years ago is not the same $100 today. As a matter of fact, $100 five years ago is about $20 a day. Somewhere in the ballpark, I'm not a fine, he's one of these financial guys, but I'm telling you, you can't get the same thing for $100 now that you could get as little as five years ago. Maybe as little as three years ago. Now, I ain't selling the farm and moving to the stinking mountains. I'd like to, but I can't move to the mountains. Somebody said one time, said, Preacher, why don't you find a place up in the mountains? We'll all put up a fence up there and we'll all move to the mountains and all that kind of stuff. No, that's not what we're supposed to be doing. You say, where are you going to find me? Right here where God called me. Amen. So it could probably all come apart. It may. It may come all apart. But the Lord didn't change where I'm supposed to go. I'm not into self-preservation. I'd rather go out fighting with my boots on and knowing if you're going to starve to death, why shouldn't I starve with you? I feel that way. I really do feel that way. I mean, if you're going out the hard way, I'm kind of like, well, nice seeing you guys. I'm on the first life boat out of here, you know. Hit the emergency eject pod, go out with Elon Musk into outer space somewhere. Not me, man. I'm praying the Lord takes us all out of here together. But if you go hard, I go hard, man. That's the way it's supposed to be. I'm going with you. I ain't, you ain't got to worry about me. If it gets tough and, you know, where's the preacher going to go? You'll find me right here. That's probably what's building over there. It's probably going to be like a stinking, I don't know, <laughs> probably a refugee camp. We'll probably all be smashed up in there like sardines. We've lost everything we have. Where are y'all at? We're hanging out at the church every day, seven days a week. And, and instead of having a sanctuary with pews and stuff in it, we'll have cots all along there. We'll look like an emergency shelter. I don't know what all that stuff is. I just know the Lord said, hey, man, you know, go ahead and build it. If you build it, they will come. Well, I mean, instead of putting in animals, we might be the animals. I don't know. I got no idea. I hope he finishes it and fills it up. But he might fill up and say, well, you wanted it filled up. Here it is. Here's a bunch of refugees that don't have nothing else. Okay. 
This place got filled up with a whole bunch of police when Monroe died. He's got funny ways of filling the building, doesn't he? You've had a great impact. You've had an ability to get the gospel out. Here's the thing you have to understand. Without application, the Bible doesn't have any impact. You can say you love the Bible, but if you don't apply it, that's not true. That's like saying you love your wife, but you never go home after work. You're going to have a hard time convincing anybody you love your wife and your kids when after you get off from work, you don't go to the house. Come on, boys. You ought to say amen to that. You say, well, you know, she ain't what she used to be. You ain't either, buddy. <laughs> Come on, let's be real. You ain't looked in the mirror in a while. You know, what's she in there primping all the time for? I can tell you why she's in there primping all the time. She's trying to get fixed up where she looks good for you. Might be good for you to do a little primping. Don't wear makeup. But it might be good for you to maybe uh, get on the treadmill a little bit. You say, why? You, you ain't all that great to look at. <laughs> you look like a whiskey barrel with pipe cleaners walking around. <laughs> and you're complaining about how she don't, the old gray mare ain't what she used to be. <laughs> yeah, the jack ain't either, buddy. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah. Now, I, I know all the controversy about makeup and all that. I like it. Amen. You say, why? I, I want my wife to be pretty. I don't, I don't want my wife being ugly for your benefit. I don't care if you don't like it. You, I'm, I'm with her. You ain't. I want her to look pretty. Amen. I don't want her running around and stinking croaker sack. Right. Right. Oh, I'm being honest with you. I'm just telling you straight up like it is. You know, it's kind of like, that don't make her more spiritual. It makes her ugly. <laughs> look, I've been with her 40 years. I mean, I'm just being straight up. You're like, my God, I'm glad I'm not married to him. I'm glad I ain't married to you. <laughs> Lord knew who I needed. She's blind in one eye and can't see out of the other one. I mean, I tell you what, I take her to a meeting with me one time and the lady asked her, said, ma'am, do you have a, a dog? And she goes, well, we used to have a dog. She goes, see an eye dog, right? <laughs> You'll get that in a minute. Now, now, the thing you have to recognize, ladies and gentlemen, is, is that biblical application shows whether or not you really believe it. You believe the Lord's coming? Yes. Well, about three quarters of you do. What about the rest of you? Well, if you believe it, do not you live like it? You don't need a preacher telling you how to live. You know how to live. You know good and well if you believe the Lord was coming tonight, there'd be some things you'd be at the altar fixing right now. Don't tell me you wouldn't. You would. You're just assuming He ain't going to come anytime soon, so you're going to hold on to Him for a while because you don't really want to get rid of Him. That's the only reason you hold on to Him. You can I tell you why I hold on to it? Because I don't want to let it go. That's the only reason you hold on to it. I know what the Bible says, but if I don't apply it, the Lord said, but I don't like it. Well, I like it. I'm keeping it. The Lord said, oh, you like it better than me, I guess. Well, no, Lord, I don't like it better than you, but I'll get it right before the rapture. <laughs> when I'm laying there right before my heart finally quits beating. I an old man was real, real stingy with money and stuff like that. It's one of the things that really bothers the Lord. You know, the Bible says the Lord loves a cheerful giver. This isn't a message on giving. Just give me a second here. He's, he's getting ready to kick the bucket, man. He's laying up there, an old miser. And they laugh and talk about him. The nickname was Scrooge and that kind of a thing. And so he's getting ready to die. And there's a $5 bill sitting over on the table by the bed there. And so the young boy, he's a young kid, he didn't know anything. He's in there seeing his granddaddy getting ready to die and that kind of thing. They come by, you know how they are, they say goodbye and, and that kind of a deal. And, and granddaddy's laying over these kind of half in and half out of it. And that little boy reached up there to grab that $5 bill. And that old man reached over to that table and grabbed it and said, Mine! Mine! That's mine! And about 20 minutes later, he kicked the bucket and went out and hand relaxed a little bit. And that little boy... Took that five dollar bill and stuck it in his pocket and you can't take it with you. Amen. Who gave it to you? You believe the Bible, don't you? The Lord loves a cheerful giver, doesn't he? Does he or doesn't he? Oh, why why is so stingy? Well, I'm not stingy. No, you're not when it comes to your house and your car and the things you want. What about what the Lord wants? You believe the Bible, don't you? Yes. <laughs> you think it's better in your hands than His? I don't care how much you got. I hope, I hope you got a whole slew pot full. I hope the bank ain't big enough to hold all you got. That's not what I'm saying at all. 
The Lord doesn't care about that. He talks about Ananias and Sapphira over there. You know what he says, Ananias and Sapphira? He said, it wasn't that you couldn't have kept whatever you want to keep. It's the fact that you told everybody you gave it all, but you didn't give it all. And he killed them. Dropped them dead. You know what happened with Achan? You remember the story of Achan. Surely you know the story of Achan. You say, what? God said, that stuff's mine. Achan said, well, you ain't going to miss a little bit. You got more than you need anyway. And the way I see it is I'm better off with it and I need this for later on down the line. And the Lord said, what you going to do with it? He said, I'm going to bear it and keep it for a rainy day. And he goes in there and digs a hole in the bottom of his tent. His family's unaware of it. And there's a Babylonian garment, a wedge of gold and silver that's down there. And then all of a sudden they go out and have a battle and lose the battle. And now there's collateral damage. And they call him out and call him out and call him out and call him out. And then Achan's like, oh, well, yeah, there's that. Yeah, there's that. You say, what was Achan's sin? Taking that stuff? No, getting God's stuff and his stuff mixed up. God said, that's mine. I don't know how that applies to you. You got a talent? Do you keep it for yourself or do you use it for God? Some of you guys are as skillful as a surgeon with a hammer and a nail gun and a tape measure and a Sharpie pen. And there's stuff you can do with that thing that, that I couldn't even think about doing. I mean, I could probably learn over a period of 40 years. I'm getting too learn, old to learn it now. But some of you folks having a talent to do that. I listen to the, all you young'uns and I appreciate the young'uns and I appreciate the elderly ones that have been doing it for years and years and years. They're great to emulate. And some of these elderly women that get up and sing and stuff and some of you elderly old men, you know what you ought to do? You need to get back up and sing. Amen. You say, why? To set an example. Right. I'm ready to hear you sing the old rugged cross, old man. I'm glad you're back, by the way, and I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad you're with us. I'm glad you're fighting off the devil. But you know what you do? You get up here. It's Everybody up here is not going to be good. It's God, does God ask you for it? Okay, good. Then let God get in it. So well, I sound like a squeaking bullfrog. Justin wasn't in his best voice this morning. Y'all must agree. Y'all are like... I mean, I thought he did pretty good, but he, he wasn't here to entertain you. The words of the song were right. He had good backup there on the piano covering up that, you know, kind of deal. I just figured he was yodeling this morning. That wasn't the greatest I've ever heard him when he hits them high notes, you know, when the four boys are up here, the four horsemen of the apocalypse get up here to sing. Yeah, man, that's a, they're all up here. There's a red horse and a black horse and a spotted and gray horse and... There's a white horse rider. There. I mean, they're all there, right? The horse of war's there. Why do you get so nervous about that? You say, what is that? That's individuals that could use their talent and do something with it otherwise. You can use your talent to sing rock and roll music in your car. Or you use your talent up here for the Lord. It ain't just money. It's am I willing to do what God wants me to do? Where God wants me to do it? I like it. I like the whole music thing is filling up now and people are getting up and singing and things like that and I got them sending me songs that they don't know about and I, I, I don't mind doing that at all. You say, well, I want to keep it on track, but I don't want to harness you from getting up here and just open your mouth and let her fly. I don't care if you get up here and sing, Jesus loves me. That thrills my soul to see you get up and want to do something for the Lord. I like to see God use you. I'm not jealous at all. When one of you gets up here and brings the house down and everybody comes to the altar, I'm like, man, brag on Jesus. Make him look good. Boy, what a blessing, man. That's like Mary. Hallelujah. Boy, I'm glad. I don't care. It's not a competition. I don't care if one of these guys gets up and preaches and everybody comes to the altar. And, Boy, Rose Sam did a great job. Boy, praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Man, the Shekinah glory came shining today. You should have heard Brother Woodard teaching on Romans. I heard that all weekend long. Uh, Brother Woodard this and Brother Woodard and other word. And one lady walked up to me in the hallway and she said, oh, we just enjoy your services so much and you and, and your associate and they're so wonderful, but we really like it when he's preaching. And pointed to Woodard and Woodard's like, "Why? whoa, wait a minute, man. <laughs> I mean, listen, Brother Broussardi gets up here and preaches. You know what? I like it when they do good. I like it when God gets on them. I like it when they make God look good. The problem comes in when you kind of make it into something it's not supposed to be. Do you, do you not want them to shine for the Lord? I mean, one of the things you have here is an anomaly. It started back in the days of youth camp. When these guys are preaching, the other guys are praying. Yeah, let them get on it, man. They like to see God get on them. They like to see the Lord get on me every now and then. They're kind of like, yeah, man, the preachers. Oh, man, I like to see it when he's hooked up like that on the rare occasion that it happens, but they like to see it when it does, right? And so here's the thing. Somebody gets up to sing and God gets in it. You know what you ought to think? Man, that's making Jesus look good. Not, I didn't get to sing if I was up there singing. 
Where'd that come from? That ain't the Bible. I don't see Jesus going, you know, well, don't be listening to John anymore. You better be listening to me. <laughs> I think I hear the voice of one crying in the wilderness. <laughs> Are you in Psalm chapter number 10? I love Sunday nights. Amen. Psalm chapter number 10, look if you will please in verse number 4. The wicked through pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Go a little bit further there in that passage. Look at verse 5. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above and out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. That just means he's like, whatever. Pfft, nobody can whip me. Pfft, I'm better than everybody. Pfft, that's puffing. That's, that's what your spouses do when they're up. Whatever, you know, that's puffing. I must have hit home there. Some of y'all are like, how do you know that? I have a camera in your house. <laughs> it's a ring camera or whatever that thing's called. Now, here's the thing you want to recognize. Do you recognize that's your natural nature that's right there? Look at the passage right there. You know what he says? Through pride of countenance. You know what he said? Pride won't let me receive instruction. We want to do the opposite of that. I told you about that this morning. Look in Galatians chapter number 5. There's a cost involved. Galatians chapter 5. Paul wants a Christian busy for a reason. You say, why? If you uh, uh, commit thy works to the Lord, uh, thy heart will be established. Thy thoughts will be established. If I'm working for the Lord, if I'm studying for the Lord, I have to tell you this, ladies and gentlemen. This is me in my own personal life. I'm less likely to have the wrong thoughts coming in. Now, I won't tell you they don't creep in. I won't tell you at times when I get ready to pray and then I get quiet and try to listen to the Lord like I mentioned to you this morning. I won't tell you that the thought doesn't try to creep in. You know what I have to do? I have to exercise my right to control how I think. You know what I say? Get out. I don't want to think about you right now. It ain't always the devil. Sometimes it's just pure old David. I don't like that. I got a little boy in me. He is a stinking brat. He's got 666 tapped on his stinking forehead. You don't even have to pull the hair back. It's right there, and it shows up in the mirror, and it looks at me on a regular basis. And every, And that little boy comes up there, why you got to pray? I got to go to the bathroom. I got a headache. I'm tired. My knees hurt. My elbows hurt. You need to assume a different position. Why can't you pray in your chair? And why do you have to do that? Why don't you pray in your bed? And why don't you do that? Shut up! I'm not telling you to shut up. I'm telling me, shut up. Get out of my head. That little guy talking to me, it's not the devil. It's me talking to me. And then I don't give it the privilege of answering him back. Shut up and get out. Well, I mean, could I at least have a cup of coffee? Shut up. There's an old uh, story told about a, a Methodist elder. And he went over there to, uh, to a guy's house, a rich fellow that was there, owned a big pig farm. And he went to the pig farm and he said, hey, he said, uh, could I ask you a question? We have a bunch of folks we were required to feed down here. And was wondering, sir, if we could bother you, would you mind letting us have a, a ham, please? Would that be okay with you? And so the, elder, uh, the old fellow said, well, sure. And the elder said, he said, just wait here in the living room. So he went out to a smokehouse and he got a ham, put it up on his shoulder. And he walked in there and he threw it off on the table. And he said, uh, there you go. And the elder said, well, I sure do appreciate that. Thank Thank you very much. It's very kind of you. I, I just can't thank you enough for that. And he got ready to go and he said, hold on just a minute. And he went back out the other way, got out to the smokehouse there and he came in with a second ham and he put it down right there. And the guy said, well, I didn't expect that. I just needed a single ham. And he said, no, it's okay. So go ahead and take both of them. And then he started walking. He said, hold on just a minute. And as he was walking out the third time, he said, if you don't shut up, I'll give him everything in the smokehouse. He's talking to the devil. He said, if you keep on telling me not to give it to him, I'm going to give him everything. Well, boy, now that's the right way to handle it. You say, why? You get ready to do something to the Lord. You know what happens? Sometimes it'll be you. Sometimes it'll be the devil. You can't do that. They don't want you to do that. Why would you do that? You ain't, why are you going to give him that? Shut up. I'll give him everything. I'll give him all of me. You keep on complaining. He wanted my hands to help wash some dishes. He wanted my feet to go to the right place. He wanted my mouth to speak. You shut up or I'll give him the whole cotton picking thing. Shut up and leave me alone. So, preacher, that just sounds ridiculous. No, it don't. No, it don't. You, come, you say, what happened? That stuff comes in your head. You say, why? You and me are a self-preserving rascal. 
and you want to do what you want to do and want to enjoy it for the here and now instead of for the hereafter. You know what you want to do? You want to hold on to you, me. What about me? What about me? What about I? What about however that thing goes? I want to hear about me. I don't want to hear about her and about the kids and about responsibility. No, that's not Christ-like. The Lord said, I don't want to hear about you. I want to hear about me. I don't share my glory with anybody. I'm a jealous God. I don't appreciate when you get up there and try to steal the show. Who gave you those pipes, Satan? Tabrets and pipes. Who gave you that ability, Satan? Who made you so pretty to look at, Satan? And you taking credit for that? Why, iniquity's right there in your heart, buddy. Your heart is lifted up in pride. And you say, why? Because you think you're all about made, self-made, self-made, self-made. Right? You say, what is that? You can't overcome that guy. That guy's strong. So what do I have to do? i got to have the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I guarantee you it'll affect your pocketbook. Thank you, Deke. I appreciate that. That's why we pay you all the big bucks around here. Galatians chapter number 5. I guarantee it will. You get ready to do something for the Lord. You know what'll happen? You'll have a missionary come through here and you'll pile them up with a big offering. And some of you put in a, you know, a little bit that you put in or that kind of a thing. I don't know what you give. Brad does. You need to pray for Brad. I don't know how he knows what you give and not get mad at you. It, well, I don't think we're any different than every other place. You say, why? I mean, some of you ain't got it to give and you give and some of you got it to give and give nothing. I'm guessing it's that way. I don't have any inside information and not dropping hints or breadcrumbs for me. But I know that that's the way it is in churches. You know, the thing that the devil will do to you and your flesh will do to you, well, you need to keep it for yourself. I mean, what happens if the economy crashes? Well, I'm not worried about the economy here. I'm worried about up there. What's God want me to do? I, I'm, I'm talking about where I'm going. You want to make an investment? Oh, I'm worried about my investment down here. What about your investment up there? You're going to spend forever up there, not down here. Suppose you lose everything. Oh, okay. With food and raiment, there with what? I think that's what he says, right? Do you know what this thing says? Don't kill me. Don't kill me. I'll die without electricity. I'll die without air conditioner. I'll die without hot water. I'll die without a refrigerator. I'll die without a bed to sleep in. I'll die. I won't be able to make it. I can't handle it. You can't do without all that stuff. I mean, a car and gasoline and electric. <laughs> I saw a funny thing the other day. This is just off the top of my head here. I saw this woman. She's over there and she's mad and she's a little bubble over her head. She should get up there and she opens the door and she screams at her husband. She said, I'm leaving you as soon as the car's charged. Charged, you know, and walked out the door. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> and then you see a picture of her, and she's about three blocks down the road. What happened to you? I left my husband, <laughs> but the battery wasn't fully charged as far as I could go. <laughs> run out of something more than gas. <laughs> Somebody was telling me in the uh, parking lot today that what you got to do is they now have a generator to come around and charge your car. Well, I got a better thing for you. I, I've got a generator at the house. Just put it on a trailer and keep your battery charged. <laughs> Just drive around and pull a trailer. <laughs> You'd be as rich as Elon Musk. You came up with a way to keep the battery permanently charged. <laughs> I got another idea. Get you one of those solar panels. And put it on top of your car so that your battery's getting a trickle charge every time you're driving. Of course, it'd be hard to do in the nighttime. Oh, okay, I better stop right there. Galatians chapter number 5, look at verse number 16. This says, say, walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You know this passage right here. Flesh lusts against the Spirit, Spirit against the flesh. And, say, and they're contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. And then he gives you the works of the flesh and so on and so forth. And then he shows you the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5 verse number 22. Ephesians chapter 4, let's hurry. Ephesians chapter number 4. Now ladies and gentlemen, what I'm trying to get across to you is, is that you and I both are a self-preserved rascal. And we get spiritual atrophy without spiritual exercise. So what we have to learn to do is do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do all to the glory of God. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter number uh, 10 thir uh, thir no thir uh, uh, 31. 1031, whatever you do in word or deed, do all to the glory of God. You say, what is that? That ain't for your flesh. Your flesh don't want to do nothing to the glory of God. Do you know you can vacuum a floor to the glory of God? 
I appreciate my wife vacuums the floor. You say, what is it? She says, oh, keeping the house clean. I don't care if you think it's for God or not. I appreciate it. I like having a clean house. Yeah. Makes things better for me. Cooking meals. I think you can do that to the glory of God. I, I believe that. I don't believe it has to be always in a pulpit. Amen. You know what I believe? I believe uh, uh, somebody came by today and just did a, a little small thing, not a big deal, and took the time to write out a little card and has some kind things to say on there about some help and so on and so forth. You say, what was that? To the glory of God. You say, what did you get out of it? Oh, I don't know, a little spiritual spizzerinkum. Yeah. A little encouragement. Amen. A little help. You ever encourage each other? I'll give you something. I haven't mentioned it in a quite some time, but I'll give you something to think about. You realize how many times reproof is in the Bible and rebuke is in the Bible? And how many times edification is in the Bible? Look it up tonight. Go home and Google it. <laughs> Ask Google. You'd be surprised. Well, if the case is there, it's not just one out of three things. You know what you find? You find over 30 times you're supposed to be encouraging people and about three or four times of the other things you're supposed to be getting on to people. Did anybody besides Russell get that? Do you spend 10 times the amount of time encouraging people as you do griping and complaining and getting on to them? Try that with your kids. You'll turn out a bunch of ogres. Some of you were raised by bullies. Some of you know what it's like to just, you never do right, you never do right, you never do right, you're never good enough, you never amount anything, and you beat you down and beat you down and beat you down, and never one time say, you look pretty today, you look nice today, you did good on your school, you know, you made a C, that's the best you can do, I would raise no idiot. Wow, you mean my grade is a reflection of you, Dad? Of you, Mom? I didn't realize that, I thought it was a grade of how smart I was. I didn't realize education was connected to your reputation. I'm not trying to be hard on you. But you know, what you, you, know what, you know what's hard to learn to do? Look, look, let me give it to you this way. Is this helping you at all? Or you want to just, you want to like get a cinnamon roll and go home? That actually sounds pretty good. But, 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 but listen, can I, can I, let, me, let me give you this. For over 20 years of my life, I was paid to be critical. They didn't pay me to be positive. They paid me to find bad guys. That's what you paid me to do. I was, that's what I was supposed to do. It's the right thing to do. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't, don't go out of here and go, well, they should make y'all more positive. No, no, you don't want a policeman that's positive and he's always looking for people that are doing right. You get overrun by criminals. You want the police to find the bad guys. And the only reason you won't aim in that is because you're a bad guy. You're like, well, if they were just busy or catching criminals instead of catching speeders... Speed kills, stupid. Yeah. Yes, sir. You won't have a problem with Granny Loomis out here and she runs into a stop sign or runs into a house for that matter. There'll be, a, you know, $10 worth of damage to the side of the house because she's going about five miles an hour. It's you idiots that run out here and run 80 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour zone and run over everything and clip over all kind of mailboxes and tear through houses and cause all kind of death and dismemberment. Your junkyards are full of them people. I don't care about speed. It don't matter to me. Nobody can tame me. Oh, okay. Well, you know what they did? They trained me to find negative behavior. I went to schools. I went to hundreds. Literally, I'm not speaking evangelistically. I'm telling you the truth. Hundreds of hours of schools to learn all kinds of different things. That was my seminary education to teach me all kinds of skills and different ways to handle things. Every one of them were to assist me at catching the bad guy. And then the Lord not only called me to preach, then he called me to pastor. And he said, now put all that in the trunk and learn to be nice to people. <laughs> I can see the zit on your forehead from a hundred miles. And I can already see the mustard mayonnaise and ketchup on the mirror. And the giant hole that's there that it created. And the Lord's like, tell them they don't look like a unicorn or cyclops. Tell them they look nice today. <laughs> You don't like looking at their face? Tell them they did a nice job on their shoes. I'm like, tell them they did a nice job on their shoes. They got a stinking zit in the middle of their head. They need to pop it. And the Lord said, um, encourage them. They're not recruits. They're not going out to face the bad guys. Tell them they did good. All of them aren't doing bad. 
any more than everybody that I ran into was a criminal. Just because you weren't wearing a blue uniform didn't mean you were a criminal. Pretty easy to get jaded, though, isn't it? Us against them. Well, I hate to tell you, the us is outnumbered. You better realize that not everybody out there may not be wearing a blue suit, but they're on your side. They'll come help you. I was at a bad situation one day. I had a couple of guys that got in a fight out off of Moncrief Road in, or Myrtle Avenue out there, uh, 45th, I can't remember, um, pool hall that was out there. And one of them took a pool cue and broke it off and hit the guy in the back of the head. And the other guy got him by the cheek right here and bit a hole about the size of a quarter out of the side of his cheek. You could see his tongue running back and forth like this. And so I, I had to, we hooked him up and had to take him to the hospital. And one brought the guy in here and they, and they saw each other in the hospital, man. And we're right there getting ready to check in to go back there to the um, place in the curtain, behind the curtains there in the emergency room. I'll give you just a quick story here. Not a war story, just a little thing. And so they get in there. Well, they see each other. And, but not only now, they've gotten their families with them. And so now they're mad. And I mean, they are going to town. And so now the families are jumping in. <laughs> And there's a little thing that you might want to recognize. I'm in the middle. And these families are swinging over me and jumping over me. And it doesn't matter how big or how strong I was. They were whipping my hind. I had a pregnant woman on my back trying to grab me by the face and turn me around like this. And there was a guy, I'll never forget him. His name was uh, Sammy was his name. He was a hospital uh, security guy. And he walked in there and he's looking around. And I mean, they got me down. And one guy's got my gun and he's, he's just about pulled it off or just about broke it loose from the belt there. He's, it's pulled loose completely. Completely, and it's about to turn loose and I'm trying to hold on to this and that's a hard thing to do when you're getting the tar knocked out of you man and I'm thinking okay well this is it and this will be the big one and so on and so forth and I'm probably making it bigger than it really was I mean we're down there man look like a pile of ants on a you know a piece of candy that fell out there and I mean they are piling on me and now all of a sudden they're not fighting each other they're just whooping me because it's my fault that you know that they're all going to jail now right and that guy walked in and he was a little bitty fella. He wasn't more than maybe five foot six or five foot seven and about skinny as a rail. And he just decided to jump in there and he grabbed one or two of them and started trying to pull them off. And he grabbed that pregnant girl by the hair of the head. He just peeled her off of me like you're peeling an onion, man. And I remember looking at him and saying, thank you. <laughs> you know, like that. Well, the troops arrived. We obviously survived and all that kind of stuff. But you know what I recognized? That guy wasn't a policeman. He didn't get paid to do that. He hadn't arrested anybody. He just saw somebody in need. Everybody in here is not your enemy. You know what you might be surprised? You might be up to your hind end in alligators one day and the most un amazing thing will happen to you. Somebody will jump in and help you when you least expect it. It won't always be the ones that you think will show up. Well, here comes Brother Larry. Well, who don't know that? It'll be somebody that'll show up all of a sudden you didn't even expect it. And you know what they do? They jump right in the middle of it and help you out at their expense. I'll never forget that guy. He showed up for all five or six of those trials that we had. I will just tell you this, just for a matter of point of clarification, they all got found guilty. That was probably mean to say that. But he showed up for every one of those trials. You know what his, you know what his testimony was? 90% of the trial, you know what his testimony was? I was just trying to help. I was just trying to help. Have you gotten training in this and that and the other? N no, but I didn't really need training. <laughs> they were jumping on him and I was just trying to help him. I credited him with and wrote him all up and got him all the accolades I could possibly get him. You know what I said? I said, you saved my life. That guy was one uh, 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 rivet away from having my gun. I don't have any doubt in my mind he'd have shot me if he'd have got it from me. One rivet. Well, the Lord supernaturally reached out in there. Yeah, he used Sammy. And Sammy jumped in there and managed to be able to help me to sustain it long enough until the troops arrived. And then after that, it was another. You, you understand what I'm saying? You got to have help. You got to encourage each other. You can't do it by yourself. Are you recognizing that yet? Ephesians chapter number 4, verse number 30. Oh my goodness, man, it's late. Can I give you one more? I'll give you the rest on Wednesday night. Let me give you this in Ephesians 4. Look in verse number 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Why? You need Him. You need Him. 
You got to have him. Don't grieve him. Why? You need him. You need backup, man. You know what you don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit for? You need his help. You don't just need each other. You need the Holy Spirit. Do you ever pray that when somebody is going through a difficult time before you straighten out all the things and say, well, bless God, let them reap what they sow. Do you ever pray for them and say, Lord, could you help them? Amen. Could you help them? Do you ever do that? Amen. Or do you just rather see them get mashed? You ever pray and say, Lord, could you, could you help them out? I think the Lord would like that. So where would you get that? I, I think that's what he prayed on Calvary. Help them, Lord, forgive them. Help them, Lord, forgive them. My own creations crucifying me. They don't know what they're doing. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you seal to the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking put away with you all malice. Be ye kind. Look at there. Was it? Are you reading it? I, I'm not. I hadn't closed it just yet. <laughs> and be ye kind, tender-hearted, even as. Or hath what? No, we started where? You believe the Bible? Do you apply it? I don't have to forgive people I love. It's kind of a foregone conclusion. The forgiveness is, is when you know you're right and they're wrong. That's how God forgave you, ain't it? Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath He forgave you. You're guilty of killing His Son. You apply it? You said you believe it. You say, why? It grieves the Holy Spirit of God when we don't practice what He told us to practice. You say, well, why is that important? You need backup. You need help. You are not going to make it by yourself. No one in that Bible has ever made it by themselves. They have all got to have help. And if you don't have help, you're not going to make it. Not successfully, you'll still get to the pearly white gates and the beautiful shores and you'll still be saved and glory to God and praise the Lord and all that. But you won't make it first class. You say, why? The Lord says you need help. You know, one of the most humbling things in the world is, is to say... Uh, I need help. I remember when my daddy was dying. I'll give you this story and we'll go home. I remember when my daddy was dying. My dad had always been a big man, a very athletic man, a real strong guy, and, you know, trained with Mr. America and all that other kind of stuff. I mean, he was a big man. He was an athlete. I remember when my dad got sick and things got kind of bad stuff and put him in the hospital and he's got all that junk going on with his liver and his stuff. It was pitiful. It was horrible watching him wasting away there. He's wasting away on one side, but he's swelling up like a toad frog and turning yellow and all those poisons and junk running through him and all that kind of deal. He was worried to death about something, saying something or doing something at the end of his life about his testimony of all things. You would think Christians would understand, you know, well, he's losing his mind. He's got poison running through his head. And he's saying, if I get that way, you know, give me some drugs, dope me up, get me out of here. I don't want to do anything to hurt your mama and to ruin my testimony. Now, he's just, that's, I mean, that's what he's dying. That's what he's thinking about. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll do that. I understand that and all that kind of stuff. And I'm watching, man. I'm watching as he gets ready to go. And we're down there at the hospital. We're at Baptist downtown. And I'm there, and I'm in uniform, and my brother and my sister are down with my mom and me. We're all down yonder talking to the hospice people, and they're going to transfer him over to the old St. Luke's and all that. And uh, Elaine knows where that is. But at any rate, we're going to transfer him down there. they got a hospice unit, and they're going to move him down there. There's nothing else we can do for him, blah, blah, blah. And I remember hearing my mom went down the hallway, and she looked in that room there and opened the door, and there's my dad laying there on the floor of that tiled bathroom and he had tried to get up the nurses weren't there to help him out and he tried to get up and he he had a, an accident there and and so he's holding on to that pole with the uh, stuff in there that you know the, the medicine and stuff in there and he's holding on that pole and he slipped in that uh, accident that he had and he's laying there on the floor and he's wallowing around stuff's all over him horrible stuff I'll never forget that and I remember running down there, you know, and I opened up that door and I'm thinking, you know, what's my mom screaming about? And I wonder if my dad was gone or something had happened and that kind of deal. And I remember looking right there on the floor as I came in the door. He's right there to the right, right there. The nurses weren't even in there yet. 
The nurses come running down there because they hear my mama screaming and I come down there and I'm looking there. Here's the illustration. Here's my dad laying there and you can see where he in that all that blood and waste and everything else and just that's enough about that. But it, but you can see where he's he's tried his best to get up and and he slipped, you know, and you got these lines going out here and you see him try over here and he's pushed and you see a couple of places where he's tried to get his feet from underneath him like that. And he's just slipped and he just keeps sliding down that wall and he's laying over there, man, like a drunk. He's laying over against that wall. And he looked over there at me and he's sort of squinting. He had glaucoma and he's looking, he's trying to get his eyes and all the medicine, you know, and he's looking and he, and I see him look at and he lock in, lock in on me like that. And I remember, I'll never forget them big old mittens he had, them big old paws and big hands of his. And I remember him leaning on his elbows and he just went. I can't do nothing. He said. I remember going over there, the nurses were hollering about gloving up and put on a double this and a double that and do this and do that and all that kind of stuff. And all I could see was my dad needed help getting up and I was going to do what I could to get him up. And I remember reaching down there, man, and grabbing him. And I, and I remember just, just, just grabbing him up. And you say, all that stuff got, yeah, yeah, it got all over me, man. I mean, every, it got everywhere. I, I remember grabbing that thing and locking my hands behind him like that. And I said, okay, let's go, Dad. Come on, let's go. Let's go, Papa Bear. I remember standing up like that. I remember holding on to him and he's trying his best to stand. He can't stand. He's leaning on me and that kind of deal. He just dropped his head over on my shoulder, just standing there. Just And the nurses come in there, man, and they're trying to get him cleaned up and stuff. And he stripped him down like the day he was born. And then on top of that, they have to stand there and wash all that stuff off. Get him cleaned up. It's infectious. They have to. That's their job. They, that's a, that's a, I, I appreciate nurses. I can't tell you, man. They go in there with a strange man there, naked as the day he's born, and he's old, and yeah. there's nothing desirous about it at all, man. And people upset and people crying and all that kind of a deal. And I remember them getting him all cleaned up and getting the floor cleaned up and getting him some towels to walk on and have him shuffle along on the towels so he doesn't get his feet dirty again, you know, and, and get him outside that thing and put that robe on him, boy, and cinch that thing down and, and pick him up. That's bigger than those days. And pick him up and put him in that bed and clean sheets and all that and roll him up there. If you were to see him right there, you'd have never known where he was about 30 minutes before. Say, preacher, that's obviously a picture of what the Lord did for you. Not, well, sure it is, but it's more than that. You know what he needed? He just needed somebody to help him. Amen. Folks, I can't do this without your help. I asked you three weeks ago, pray for me. You say, why? I don't know that I've ever done other than, you know, pray for me. She's sick. she got cancer and pray for me. I'm not doing well. But I mean, I think you picked up on, I need help, man. I need prayers. I don't know who else to tell. I tell you, help me. Pray for me. You know what's coming? There's coming a time you ain't going to be able to make it without each other. You need each other. You need to pray for one another. You say, why? You need help. You're not going to overcome the flesh on your own. If you're hanging around people that are causing you to be in the flesh, get away from them. Hang around people that don't make you do stupid stuff. I ain't just talking about smoking and drinking. Hang around the right people. If they ain't doing right, get away from them. Amen. They ain't no love lost. Amen. Pray for them, but get. Amen. All right, let's stand together be dismissed.